Hello guys, once again I welcome you all to this new video. As you all may be aware that the Royal College is planning to move from its current format of short answer questions to single best answers. There are not many resources available for examinees to try these questions out and I'm sure the college must be working out on the sample questionnaires and the regulations which will be released soon on the Royal College website. Here is my attempt to give some practice to you all who are planning to take this exam from September onwards for the FRKM Intermediate and the FRKM Finals. So how we are going to do in this video is I want you all to pause the video over here, grab a pen and a paper and be ready to answer the questions and then we check the answers as we go along. Here we are going to discuss five questions today and I'll give you the explanations of those five questions. So without wasting further time, let's start. The new format of the FRKM Intermediate and the final exam will be, there will be 90 questions to be covered in two hours and the exam will be taken in two sessions of two hours each, likely on the same day. So 90 questions in two hours, let us assume that there are 100 questions in two hours, that means you have 72 seconds per questions. So time will be crucial and critical. How you're going to appear, approach these questions is, you're going to read the last line of the whole big clinical scenario which is given and then read the options and then go back to read the question and there you will be able to narrow down your choices. So we'll give, give it a practice over here and without wasting further time, let's begin with the first question. What features suggest a need for operative evaluation? Diminished pulsations as compared to the right limb, hypotension that responds to IV fluids, expanding hematoma, continuous bleeding despite wound repair, intoxication status. Now let's read the clinical stem. 27 year old male is presented to the emergency department with isolated laceration to the left thigh that crosses the knee joint. The limb is splinted and appears to be cold but distal pulses are well felt. There is no obvious bony abnormality. He appears intoxicated, he is tachycardic and there are no stigmata of any other injuries. You can pause the video over here and make a guess. Let us look at the explanation now. So in the question scenario, they had mentioned that there is a laceration to the knee joint. What they are trying to emphasize is for us to identify the hard signs. Hard signs are an expanding hematoma, a pulsatile bleeding, absent pulses, palpebral thrill, and a cold or pale limb. If any of these hard signs are present, the patient needs to go for operative management. The same thing applies to the injury to the neck. A penetrating neck injury, initially we used to classify them as in zone 1, zone 2, zone 3. And now we have moved on from zonal classification to looking for hard signs. If hard signs are present, patient needs operative evaluation. If hard signs are absent, you can further investigate to see the extent of damage. So in this example, there was an expanding hematoma. Well, this question further highlights few things. You need to have an understanding of the surface anatomy of the major blood vessels in the upper and the lower limbs, so as to identify that there may be a vascular injury. If heart signs are absent and your clinical suspicion is high, get a CT angiogram for these patients. So let us look at the answer. The answer is expanding hematoma. That means this patient needs operative evaluation. Let us look at question number two here. Which of the following is true regarding the diagnosis under consideration? Most patients will report weakness, hypophosphatemia may result, Myoglobin has a long half-life and will be elevated for 24 hours. Alkalinization has been found to be useful. Excessive fluid resuscitation may result in compartment syndrome. 34-year-old footballer has recently resumed his practice regime since after a long break. He is in the department with complaints of lethargy and weakness. You notice his observations suggest mild tachycardia and his urine dipstick is positive for hematuria. So you can pause the video over here, make a wild guess and then we will look at the explanation. First step is to identify what diagnosis they are looking at and you guys must have guessed it right. The diagnosis is rhabdomyolysis. So myoglobin in urine can show a urine dipstick positive for blood but 
when you look at under the microscope, there will be hardly any RBCs. Rhabdomyolysis is classified as mild, moderate and severe based on the CPK levels. The creatinine phosphokinase level, if it is raised 10 times the normal, that means it's mild. If it's between 10 and 50 times the normal range, it's moderate and more than 50 times the, the normal range is severe rhabdomyolysis. However, one point to note over here is an elevated CPK level does not correlate with the extent of kidney injury. So alkalinization is not useful. In rhabdomyolysis, you will see an increase in potassium and an increase in phosphate. Hyperphosphatemia may happen, not hypophosphatemia. In rhabdomyolysis, the treatment is hydration. Hydration is the key, but be wary of excessive hydration may lead to compartment syndrome. There is an article from which this question has been made. I'll put the link of that article below for you guys to go and read it. Without wasting further time, let's see question number three. Which of the following would hold true regarding compartment syndrome? An open wound rules out compartment syndrome. Intracompartmental pressure greater than 20 is considered diagnostic. Delta pressure is equal to compartmental pressure minus diastolic pressure. Elevation of affected limb above the level of heart is useful. Compartment syndrome can occur at lower pressures in hypotensive patients. Now let us read the question. 79 year old male with chronic conditions such as diabetic type 2 hypertension and ischemic heart disease on aspirin and clopidogrel was a restrained passenger in a T-bone collision. He is in the department with complaints of painful right leg. The distal examination suggests tender and tense swelling in the calf but neurology and pulses distally seem to be normal. On imaging the lower limb of the following, uh, on imaging the lower limb, the following image is obtained. The question says, which of the following would hold true regarding compartment syndrome? That means I don't even have to bother to look at the image at the moment. However, if you are interested, you can pause the video over here and look closely at the image and the image shows there is a fibular shaft fracture. I'm sorry, the image is of the left wing and the scenario describes right limb. Uh, this was what was available and I, I put it up over there. So let us look at the explanation now. If you noticed, reading the whole scenario and x-ray interpretation was unnecessary for the exam purposes. Compartment syndrome, you need to have the knowledge of the number of compartments in the leg. Take a wild guess, how many compartments are present in the leg? Guessed it right, there are four compartments in the leg, anterior, lateral, posterior superficial and posterior deep ones. An open wound does not rule out compartment syndrome. Intracompartmental pressure greater than 30 is considered diagnostic and needs a fasciotomy. Delta pressure is diastolic pressure minus compartmental pressure. Delta pressure is diastolic pressure minus compartmental pressure, DDC. Delta pressure less than 30 millimeters of mercury is diagnostic and needs fasciotomy. Elevation of the affected limb up to the level of heart is useful, not above the level of heart is useful. So compartment syndrome can occur at lower pressures, especially if the patient is hypotensive. So let us look at the answer over here. And you guys must have got it right. The answer is compartmental pressures can increase and compartment syndrome can happen at lower pressures in a hypotensive patient. Let us look at question number four here. Which of the following is true regarding dislocated patella? Patella dislocations are often medial. Post-reduction x-rays are not indicated if procedure was uneventful. Post-reduction knees immobilized to keep in flex position. She is at high risk of recurrence. She should refrain from walking from now on. 17-year-old girl is in the department with complaints of hearing a pop in her right knee while playing volleyball. On your assessment, you diagnose it as patella dislocation. Let us now look at the explanation. Patella dislocations are often lateral rather than medial. So option number one is out. You need post reduction. You need to immobilize the knee in extension, not in flex position. And after reduction, you need to get a post reduction image to rule out associated injuries. We do not want to immobilize and tell the patient not to walk for their life. 
in fact, by doing that, you're going to provoke DVTs. We don't want to do harm. So the answer in this scenario is once a dislocation, always a dislocation, which is this. She's at high risk of recurrence. Let us move to the last question of the day. Here it is. Which of the following is most common infective cause of acute chest syndrome in patient with sickle cell disease? Strep pneumonia, Staph aureus, Klebsiella pneumonia, Mycoplasma pneumonia, Parvovirus. 21 year old male is in the ED with complaints of shortness of breath, fever and chest pain for two days. His chest x-ray suggests pulmonary infiltrates. He is known to suffer from sickle cell disease. You guys must be thinking, this is a primary question. This is a basic science question. No, it is a question for your entire life. It's a question which you should remember. You need to have an understanding of your basic sciences at the bedside and should be able to apply it. So what are the organisms that a sickle cell patient is always prone to get infected with? In general, they are the capsulated organism because they undergo autosplenic tummy. So capsulated organisms are Haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitidis, uh, Klebsiella, Staph aureus, Strep pneumonia, Salmonella, Shigella. Let us look at the explanation for this question. The acute chest syndrome is the leading cause of death in sickle cell patient. About one fourth of the patient of sickle cell anemia will die of acute chest syndrome. Most causes of acute chest syndrome is unknown, about 46% as per up to date. Infective causes in terms of bacterial is more common than viral causes. And the bacteria which is more, most common to cause acute chest syndrome are chlamydia pneumonia and mycoplasma pneumonia, not the capsulated organisms which we discussed earlier. However, the capsulated organisms can cause septicemia in these patients and can lead to death as well. But in acute chest syndrome, the most common organisms are bacterial and in bacterial, they are the chlamydia and mycoplasma pneumonia accounting to up to 14% of the causes. Power virus accounts to about 6% of the causes of acute chest syndrome. One more pearl I'll give you over here is, if a patient with sickle cell anemia gets infected with power virus infection, he is prone to develop aplastic crisis. Power virus in sickle cell anemia or thalassemia will lead to aplastic, aplastic crisis. So the answer here is mycoplasma pneumonia. I hope you enjoyed this session and this was interactive. For all of you who secured five out of five correct, tap your back, well done. I will see you soon in my next video with five more questions and please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Share this video with your friends, colleagues and everyone who would be interested in learning more about emergency medicine. I've got some resources related to the short answer questions. Uh, I can post those videos for those who are going to appear for the exam in March and that they may find it useful. Uh, but if you guys want them, please put up your comments below and I will try to upload them. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, happy Valentine's Day and peace.